Welcome back. Uh, you're watching Power Lunch. Let's uh, bring in a special voice. Thomas Rich Richardson, Senior Resident Representative of India, uh, is joining us right now at IMF. Uh, uh, Thomas, great having you with us. Uh, let's talk about uh, your recent GDP forecast. Mm -hmm. I mean, that caught a lot of people by surprise, but I think it was actually coming because what we are going through at this point of time. Right. Let's let's talk about that. Sure, sure. Well, and you know, our um, our global forecasts were issued. Uh, we do this four times a year, so our global forecasts were issued in uh, July, the beginning of July, uh, and we downgraded uh, growth for the globe by about 0.2 percent of GDP to a little bit above three percent, both for this year and a little bit better for next year. Um, mainly driven by you know still some continued concern about what's happening in Europe. A little bit of concern about what's happening in the U.S. since the sequester is still having some impact on growth in the U.S. And then also, uh, and I think this is a bit of a new factor, we are becoming a little bit more pessimistic about emerging market economies where growth seems to be a little bit softer across a range of emerging market economies, including uh, India. India's growth, uh, we downgraded a little bit from, from about 5.8% to 5.6%. That's for this year uh, and uh, to about 6.3% next year. Uh, again, you know, driven by some concerns about uh, infrastructure bottlenecks, uh, softness in external demand, and the you know, ongoing uh, Im implications of the need for policy to maintain some, some tightness in view of relatively high inflation and the relatively high current account deficit. Thomas, uh, you know, IMF has indicated that uh, as far as monetary policy goes, that's going to be perhaps the first line of defense uh, against downgrade risks. But given that we've seen inflation coming back once again, uh, do you think that the position that the RBI is in at this point is it's quite tough mm -hmm. and uh, on the 30th of July we're likely to see a status quo perhaps. Well, I w wouldn't begin to comment on what would happen, you know, at a policy meeting by a central bank, and I would never do that. I mean, I, th I think that's probably inappropriate for the fund. Uh, you know, I just, stepping back again, taking a bit of a longer run view, I think it's very important to think, you know, longer run about where India is going and what, what India needs to do to manage its twin deficits, both current uh, account deficit and fiscal deficit, as a way of creating some space for, for monetary policy. Um, I do think also, you know, one important feature of the Indian economy that we've noticed over the recent period, and it's not only true for India, but it's also true for some other uh, emerging market economies. We think that potential growth may have uh, declined a bit. And, and as potential growth comes down, that means that, you know, relative to where, where actual growth is, the output gap, you know, may be shrinking and it could be that the, the room for maneuver for monetary policy is just, is just shrinking, therefore. So we, we do believe over time that, you know, it's important to maintain a fairly tight stance of monetary policy, uh, but, but most importantly not to take one's eye off the, the medium-term prize of getting growth going by, you know, getting investment projects going, unlocking, um, you know, big investment projects, because those are the things that will ultimately generate growth and create room for monetary policy. But are we looking at short-term hiccups or are we talking about a protracted sort of diminishing of strength? What with, you know, crude oil, rupee, etc. The return to positive economic data seems mm -hmm. just that much far away. You know, it's interesting that you ask, you put it that way, because the return to positive economic data, if, like me, you look at India across uh, many countries, um, India's, fig India's uh, growth data looks pretty good, I mean, globally. I think that's an interesting thing. I mean, if lots of countries would, would kill to have 5% growth, right? So you, I think you look across countries, this is, a, this is not such a bad situation. You know, relative to the heydays of the middle part of the last decade when growth was up, you know, close to 10%, of course there's some decline and, and we all think that it's important to get growth going back up to, you know, those, you know, high single digit, that high single digit range. Um, so that, but that's a medium term thing. We think it's important, you know, to maintain the effort to improve uh, the in investment climate and to attract foreign direct investment and also domestic investment to get things going that way. So I, I think, you know, we, the, at the moment, we're still pretty optimistic about India. We think that the medium term is, is um, you know, a rosy one. But in the short run, it's very important to deal with those, those bottlenecks and get things going that way. Sure. Thomas, you know, uh, another issue which caught my attention was the fact that our forex reserves are at a three-year low. At, I think it's about $280 billion. And our import cover would last, I think, just six months at this rate. How similar or how different is the situation from what we saw in 1991? Do you think we are approaching that kind of a situation if nothing's done sooner? 
Uh, it's nothing like the 1991 situation. I think you know having you know almost six months of reserves is quite a quite a healthy margin. Actually, and we, we've done quite a lot of work on what is the you know analytical work on what's the appropriate amount of reserves for a country to have. And India is well within the comfort zone, so there's no issue there. Most importantly, I think India's flexible exchange rate regime is really a source of strength for India. Um, having a flexible exchange rate gives you the you know kind of a shock absorber to the economy, and that's very helpful. So we think you know you you obviously need less reserves if you uh, have a flexible exchange rate. And, and from that perspective, we think it's quite important that the flexible exchange rate regime be, be maintained. Thomas, one of the most active discussions right now around the globe seems to be about uh, a departure from you know, quantitative easing, both in the US and the UK, even though both of these countries are experiencing high unemployment rates. But of course, we've already heard Mr. Bernanke talking about you know, the fact that nothing is written in stone. But then this has severe implications as well. So I'm wondering what would be the implications for India once uh, we see the Fed starting to dial down its uh, quantitative easing? Well, you know, clearly, I mean, over time as uh, interest rates, you know, that, that'll have an impact on interest rates in, in the U.S. and that'll have some implications for the way uh, the flow of funds moves, right? India has looked like a fairly attractive, from a, from a relative interest rate standpoint, looked like a relatively attractive destination for, for money over the recent period. And I, and, and I think it will have some implications for the cost of financing here. Uh, that's, that's a fact of the world, right? It's, in a way, it's like the weather. You can complain about it, but it's, it is a, a, a fact uh, out there. Um, Importantly, I think India has lots of room for maneuver in the sense that uh, um, the, there, there are steps that they can take to make investment more attractive. I mean, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, the attitude of India to foreign direct investment, for instance, has been a little bit, you know, mixed over time. And I think if you take, if the, if the country, you know, reaches a consensus on being more attractive and more willing to attract foreign direct investment, that will bring in those funds. I think every investor I've ever talked to wants to be in India, wants to be here for the long run, wants to be, you know, contributing to, you know, this, the largest democracy on the planet. So I think there's a lot of demand, a lot of appetite out there for India. And, you know, just a question of, you know, allowing that, those funds to come in. And I think in that sense, you know, I, I think India is in a very enviable position compared to many other countries around the world. Mm -hmm. You have the room to, to solve the problems. It's important just to take the short run steps to, to do that. So this is the long only money that is staying in India, right? Because uh, the possibility of further FIR outflows, it's quite significant. Well, short, short run money comes and goes, right? That's the way, that's the whole point of it, right? And so what happens in the short run effects, it has some constraining uh, um, implications for the stance of monetary policy and, all, and also for fiscal policy. And so there, you know, the, you, you have to walk a um, balancing act if you're a monetary authority in a situation like this. And I'm, we're quite confident that the RBI understands the, the global picture, the picture in India, and, you know, has the tools at hand to uh, manage this, this situation. So. Richard, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming into our thank studios. Thank you very much.